Well, good evening, friends. It's lovely uh, to be with you tonight for your online broadcast. And I want to well, uh, thank the Reverend uh, Ferguson for the opportunity just to share a, a personal word of testimony. And it's always a wonderful privilege to be able to tell people what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in your life. And I don't know who will be watching this evening, but I pray if you're a Christian that you'll really be encouraged by what the Lord has done in my life and in my family. And if you're not a Christian, that even tonight you may put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a Bible, could I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it's always so important that we read the Word of God. The Bible reminds us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read at verse number 14. And this is the Apostle Paul, of course, writing to the church at Corinth. Paul here states, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creature. The old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, and we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. And verse 21 to close, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we'll stop there at verse 21, and may the Lord as always add a blessing to the reading and to the preaching of his word. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father, we just pray now as we come around your word and as we share a personal uh, word of testimony that, Lord, you would help us tonight. Lord, I ask for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would come and bring all things to my remembrance and pray for those that listen this evening, that, Lord, that you may uh, challenge them, that you may strengthen them, Lord, that you may help them in these days. I pray that you would save precious souls I pray, Lord, that you would restore the backslider and pray, Lord, even your own dear people may be revived in these days. These things we ask in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, it's verse number 17 tonight I want to leave with you as I share a word of personal testimony. Look at verse number 17 again. The Apostle Paul here states, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. You see, when a man accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, he gets a new life and he gets a new longing. Everything is completely new. When a man gets saved, he gets a new father, he gets a new family, and he also gets new friends. His company is changed and his character is changed. When a man is truly converted, he has a love for God, he has a love for the Bible, a love for the prayer meetings, and even a love for his enemies. His temper, his tongue, his temptations are changed. He is a new creation. The old life has gone. And it's what the Bible calls being born again. And folks, I can honestly say tonight that being born again of the Spirit of God is the greatest thing in the world. And it's not what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, a very religious man. Jesus told that man, except the man be born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, as you know, my name is John Weir and I live in Belfast here. And I was brought up right beside Windsor Park, which is the national football stadium. And from a young age, growing up beside the national football stadium, I always wanted to be a professional footballer. And as a young lad, I was going to many different football clubs 
in England and in Scotland. And at 16, I was just about to sign for Chelsea. And Chelsea had a wonderful player when I was a young fella called Gianfranco Zola. He was a very famous footballer. He was small. He was an Italian. I'm small. And I always dreamed of signing for Chelsea. And at 16, I was just about to sign the contract and disaster struck. I hurt my knee and I had to come home from London and it was absolutely gutted as you can imagine. But I recovered from that particular injury. I went on to be the captain of the uh, Northern Ireland Youth International football team. Things were going great again. And then I was also uh, joined a, a local team in Belfast called Linfield, who were sort of the top uh, team in Northern Ireland. And, and, and that was a dream of, of mine to, to play for, for Linfield at the National Football Stadium. And here at 19, I hurt my knee again in, in a real bad way. And I had to stop playing football completely at 19 years of age. And at that time, I just felt as if my whole world had just completely fell apart. My dreams were shattered. Things were going on within my family. And really, my life at 19 years of age was a bit of a mess. And maybe even not someone listening to the broadcast tonight. But you know, friends, looking back now as a Christian, I can see that God had a completely different plan for my life. And I want to remind you tonight as you listen that God has a plan for your life. And it's only when you fall in love with Jesus Christ do you realise what that plan is. And Jeremiah 1 in the verse number 5, God tells the prophet, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. You see, folks, I was chasing after the things of this world, but had no thought about my soul. And maybe that's you. As I travel Northern Ireland doing the work of an evangelist now, I meet many people and they're selling their soul for the drink. They're selling their soul for drugs. They're selling their soul for a moral living. They're selling their soul for the, for the partying scene, even what their friends and family will think of them. And the Bible reminds us in Proverbs 14 and the verse 12 that there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And I was even just thinking recently, you know, hell is going to be uh, full of people even that knew the gospel, that knew that they should be saved. We're brought up listening to sermons week after week after week, and maybe that's you. But sadly, many never make the step. Jeremiah 8 and 20, we're reminded that the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. I'm so thankful I'm here tonight giving a word of personal testimony than on my way to hell, living an ungodly life. And growing up, sadly, I had no Christian influence whatsoever. My, my parents were, were good people, but they more or less let us make our own decisions. Before I became a Christian, sadly, I was never in a Sunday school. I was never in a, in a church, never in a gospel meeting before, or never in a gospel mission. Uh, but deep down in my heart, I, I still believed in God. When I, when I looked at the stars at night and the birds and the trees and the wonders of creation, I knew there had to be a God. I knew I just wasn't an accident. And at 19 years of age, when my football dream had ended, my family was a bit of a mess, my life was going nowhere, I remember getting onto my knees in my bedroom and crying unto God to help me in my life and to help my family. And Ian e. Bounds is a great author in prayer and he said these words. He says, there's prayers, but then there are desperate prayers. And maybe even as you listen tonight, you're in a desperate situation in your life. Maybe you're going through something terrible. Well, that was me at 19. But I got on my knees and I cried unto the Lord to help me. And as I cried unto the Lord from the depths of my heart, I remember a presence coming upon me in that room. And I knew that everything was going to be okay. And Jeremiah 29, 13, God again tells the prophet, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. And that is the secret. And that same night, I cried unto the Lord in my bedroom. I knew I had to go to church. And the way the Lord had planned it, my mother was working with a lovely Christian lady in the, in the Belfast City Hospital, our local hospital. And that wee lady planted a seed. 
And that wee lady began praying for me and for my family. And I remember that Sunday night going to her church and hearing the simple message of the gospel for the very first time. And you know, folks, the preacher that night spoke all about the cross. He spoke all about the Lord Jesus and all that he went through so that I could be forgiven. So I could have a brand new life and so I could go to heaven when I died. And that's exactly what I needed, a brand new life. And the preacher that night read from Isaiah chapter 53. And I just want you to picture the Lord on that middle cross. And here Isaiah got a vision some 750 years before it happened. In Isaiah 53 and the verse number 5, we are told, but he was wounded. Can you see the Lord? Dying there for you, dying there for me. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And men, women, young people, that night, as I heard that simple message of the gospel for the first time, I realized that Jesus died for me, for my sin, for my shame, for my skeletons in the cupboard, for my broken life, Jesus died for me. And do you know what I experienced? I experienced conviction of sin. I wonder if you've ever experienced that. That's what I experienced that, that night. And I knew I couldn't leave that church until I got right with the Lord. I didn't understand everything. But I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed to be saved. And I realized Jesus Christ took my place on the middle cross. And I remember during that gospel service singing a lovely hymn penned by Philip Bliss. And I'm sure many of you love the old gospel hymns. And this is what Philip Bliss penned. And it really spoke to my heart that night. As I heard the congregation singing it, Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruined sinners, you see, that was me. I was a ruined sinner. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a saviour. Bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place, condemned he stood. He sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a saviour. And after that time, I just then couldn't wait to tell everybody about this man that had, that had changed my life. I remember going the next day, that was around 17 years ago now, and I remember the next day, I remember going to the Faith Mission bookshop, a Bible bookshop in Belfast to, to buy a Bible as I didn't have one. And then I couldn't wait to start going to the prayer meetings. I couldn't wait to start going to the Bible studies. I couldn't wait to start going to the Sunday services. I couldn't wait to tell everybody about this man that had changed my life. Do you remember those days? And it's not what the hymn writer penned, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I remember just going to church on my own because I didn't know any Christians. I didn't know anybody that, that loved the Lord. Uh, none of my family were Christians. But deep down within my heart, there was a real desire to learn more about the Bible and to get to the place of prayer and to start praying for my, uh, my family. And, and ever since I got saved, God has put a real burden in my heart to win souls. It's hard to explain. But it's not what Jesus said in Matthew 4, 19. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I started going to the prayer meetings and started praying for my mom and my dad and my sister and my two aunts. And God started to save them one by one. My mother went to Sunday school in Belfast just to encourage you folk that work with children. My mother went to Sunday school. The seed was planted in her wee heart from, from a young age. Uh, but sadly, as she got older in their teenage years, she wanted to see all the, the things of the world and enjoy all the sin of the world. But, but, but she saw the change in my life. And around 12 years ago, she got gloriously converted. The desire for cigarettes left. The desire for alcohol left. And it's just been wonderful to see the change in her life. Uh, her mother died and her sister died in the space of a year. And that really started to make her think about eternity. When she saw uh, the coffins going down into the ground, she started to think, if, that, if that's me, where am I going to spend eternity? And sometimes death can really make us think. And death really spoke to my mother. 
Uh, and, and she then came to church with me. And it's just been truly fantastic, truly wonderful to see how the Lord has saved her and how the Lord is using her in these days in, in the Belfast City Hospital uh, where she works. And then we started praying for my dad. And my dad was just a man of the world. He worked hard for his family, but he was out Friday night drinking. He was out Saturday night drinking. He was hungover on a Sunday. And my dad really had no time for the Lord. But he saw the change in my life. He saw the change in my mother. And he knew that this was real. And I used to leave little gospel tracts, little gospel leaflets sitting about the kitchen in our family home. And my dad read one of these gospel tracts about the second coming of the Lord. And I think that we all realize as we see what's going on in our world today, that the Lord Jesus is coming very, very soon. If you read Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, you will read about all the signs of the Lord's return. And my dad read this little gospel track about the Lord's return. And I want you to even to picture it in your mind. Can, can you see it? The Lord says when he returns, there's going to be two in a field. So one will be taken and the other will be left. The Christian will go, the un, unsaved person, the non-Christian person will be left behind. One will go, one will be left behind. The Lord says there'll be two grinding in the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. There'll be two in a bed, one will be taken, one will be left. And after reading that gospel leaflet, my dad started to experience what I experienced, conviction of sin. And for three days, for three nights, he couldn't sell. He couldn't eat. He couldn't do anything because the Lord was working on his heart. And he was driving the car uh, down the Ravenhill Road in East Belfast. And he pulled the car in. They had just a local playing fields. And he cried unto the Lord to save him. And there in the end, in his car, he got wonderfully saved. He didn't pray a big, long theological prayer. He just prayed simply from his heart, God, will you be merciful to me a sinner? And there and then, 12 years ago, sitting in his car, he got wonderfully saved. And friends, to see the change in his life now, a man of the world, completely transformed by the gospel. And it's even wonderful when, when maybe you're at a gospel mission and you're at a meeting and you're singing the old gospel hymns and I look down at my dad and you see the tears coming down his cheeks. Because you see, his heart has been softened by the Lord. And this is what the Lord Jesus can do. And then we started praying for my sister. And my sister was going through a, a tough time in her life. And around 10 years ago, she accepted the Lord as her own and personal saviour. And she's now bringing up her wee family in the fear and, and the admonition of the Lord and it's truly wonderful to see what the Lord has done for her and then I took a gospel mission a couple of years ago here in Belfast and my two aunts trusted the Lord at 60 years of age and it's just been really really wonderful to see an entire family a family that had no time for the gospel completely changed and it's just amazing what the Lord has done and and, and I just give him all the praise and all the honour and all the glory. And can I encourage the Christian people listening tonight to the broadcast, keep praying for your loved ones. Maybe, maybe you have a, a son not saved. Maybe you have a daughter not saved. Maybe your mother, your father, maybe you have, you have grandchildren that have went astray, that have been brought up in good Christian godly homes, but that, that went astray. They're like the prodigal son in Luke 15. Can I encourage you tonight, keep praying for them. Keep praying for them because God has a thousand ways to answer every prayer. It all started in my life and in my family through that lady that my mom worked with in the local hospital. And she started praying for us. She was the instrument that God used. And it's just been wonderful what the Lord has done. So always be at the prayer meeting in your church, in your local fellowship. Always be at the place of prayer, even in your family home. Have the family altar. Sit down as a family. Read the Bible together. Pray together. And pray for your loved ones. Pray for your friends. And pray for your neighbours to be saved. And after, as I say, I was converted at a real burden to win souls for the Lord. And we started doing a lot of open airs and outreaches and started travelling all over Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Just trying to reach souls with 
the gospel. And I spent a lot of my time in Dublin, uh, down in the Republic of Ireland. And that was a real training ground. That was a place that I loved to go just to share the gospel with, with, with others. And we had some wonderful times on the streets of Dublin. And then seven years ago, I gave up my job to go out and do the work of, of an evangelist. For all that the Lord has, has done for me and my family, I said, Lord, I, I want you to use me. And, and there was a lady who was dying in one of the local hospitals and I couldn't get to see her because I was working in the school at the time. And I said, Lord, that will not happen again. If there's a lady dying in the hospital, I will be there. I will be there to reach her. And I stepped out in faith and now I have the great privilege of just going all over the country presenting the gospel message to men and women and young people. And that's what I live for, is to see people transformed by the same message that has transformed me and transformed my family. And friend, God can use every one of us. We've all been given a gift. We've all been given a talent. We've all been given ability. We can all do something for the Lord. And I trust tonight that, that you're doing something for the Lord. A missionary was telling me a powerful story of an elderly woman in Iran. And, and she can't read and she's just got saved. And she goes onto the bus and she makes sure it's safe. And then she brings out her New Testament with different verses underlined. And she sits down beside somebody on the bus and she asks them to read the verses to her. And many are getting converted through this lady. Isn't that wonderful? We all love the, the hymns of Fanny Crosby. She was blind and she wrote over 8,000 hymns. D.L. Moody worked in a shoe store. He became a great evangelist. Amy Carmichael suffered from a disease of her nervous system, but was used in a wonderful way in India. Oh, in these last days of time, that we would all get a burden. Get a burden for precious souls. Even when was the last time you witnessed to someone? When was the last time you gave somebody a little gospel track? When was the last time you told someone your testimony? The people that you live beside, you've maybe lived beside them 10, 20, 30 years. When was the last time you spoke to them about their need to be saved? This is the need of the hour because the Lord is coming and he's coming very, very soon. And, and I pray God has burdened my heart for revival. God has burdened my heart that he would that he would move and I would seek him and God would use even the like of me or somebody else to bring revival. An old preacher told me not, longer, not long after I was converted that when God sees the sacrifice, then he will send the fire. God can get the hold of a man that is totally yielded, totally consecrated. That's the type of individual the Lord can use. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, once said this, that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. It's not good. The greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. Alan Redpath was an old Baptist preacher and he said this, when God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible man and he crushes him. And maybe there's someone listening to the broadcast tonight and God's hand is on your life. Maybe even for full-time service. Maybe to go to the mission field. Maybe to do something. Maybe to step out in faith. Friend, if the Lord is calling you, even tonight, you go. You go and serve the Lord with all of your heart. And don't get to the end of your life with regrets. I get a lot of calls to see people and they're dying in the hospital and they're coming to the end of their lives. And they say, John, I should have done more for the Lord. But I was caught up making money. I was caught up in my farm. I was caught up with my job. I was caught up with all the material things in the world, but I never did enough for the Lord. I don't want to be like that. I want to look at the Lord on that great day and him say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Do you ever think about the first conversation you're going to have with the Lord Jesus? What's he going to say to you? What are you going to say to him? Oh, that we'll not be ashamed when we see him. And we'll hear the well done of God. The Bible reminds us that God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the ways. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Brother, sister, tonight, let's always stay humble in the work of the Lord. Let's always realize that no matter what we do, that the Lord may always get the praise, the honor and the glory. 
And whatever I do for the Lord, I always want him to get the glory because he's a wonderful, wonderful saviour. I love him with all of my heart. And I want to love him more. And I want to serve him more for all that he has done for me. So we'll finish with our text. 2 Corinthians 5 and the verse number 17. Paul reminds us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Notice that you're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. Paul says, if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. The old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And maybe you're listening to the broadcast tonight and maybe just maybe your life is a bit of a mess. Maybe you're listening and you're burdened about your life. You, you, you're not really sure if you're saved or not. Friend, even as you listen, or even when this broadcast is over, why don't you get on your knees and ask the Lord into your life? The Bible reminds us in Romans 10, the verse 13, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Or maybe there's someone listening and the Lord is calling you as I've said, into the mission field or in the full-time service, why not from tonight totally consecrate yourself to his work? Because he can do something wonderful with your life. remember hearing a story about a young man that worked alongside Hudson Taylor and he felt the call of God was on his life. But he had nothing really to give to the Lord financially. He had no money and he was at a missionary convention and the plate was being... Uh, are being taken around and given out around the different people. And this young man, he said, Lord, I've nothing to put in the basket on the offering, in the offering plate. He, he says, but I'm going to put myself. I'm going to put myself on the offering plate. I'm going to give you my life completely. And he went to work with Hudson Taylor and he saw God do amazing things. As Stuart Hamlin penned, it is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Friends, that's just a few uh, thoughts and uh, so what the Lord has done in my life. And I just want to thank him for, for, for saving me tonight. I want to thank him for, for transforming my life. And I pray that just what the Lord has done for me might inspire you and might encourage you to go deeper with him. There's only one life and it will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ, for Christ will last. If I can be of any help, the Reverend Ferguson can be of any help, please get in touch. We would love to help you. I'm just going to pray as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day and hour you saved me and transform my life and my family. I love you tonight with all of my heart. Lord, I pray that you would continue to use me in these days to be a winner of souls. Lord, I thank you for all that have tuned in tonight to the broadcast. Lord, I pray if there's somebody listening even right now and they're not saved, that, oh God, that they might call upon your name for salvation. If there's somebody listening and they've got away from their first love, oh, they're in the far country tonight. Lord, I pray that they'd be restored. And Lord, even for somebody listening, and they know that the call of God is on their life to go into full-time service, to go to the mission field, to go to Bible college, to go that wee bit deeper. Lord, I pray that even tonight, that they might fully consecrate themselves to your work. Lord, help us to give you everything in these last days of time. Help us to lay everything on the altar. And when we see you in that great day, will not be ashamed. Continue to bless all the brothers and sisters in Singapore. We thank you for them and thank you for their ministry and pray that, Lord, even in the local church there, that, Lord, many, many would be saved in these days and it would continue to be a rescue shop within a yard of hell. We ask these things in the beautiful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. God bless you richly. Thank you.